<clears throat> All right, the record is on, and I am going to uh, do this homework assignment um, just so that you guys know, you know, what type of concept is trying to tie in, um, and you know, and then it will help you to prepare for the next homework assignment because this one is called negative exponent, right? So can someone guess what is the next homework assignment? There you go. Yep. <clears throat> Always you know, look for the pattern, right? Always look at, look at the pattern and go like, okay, if this is all happening, what is the next thing that is going to happen? <clears throat> all right, so let me get started with this, okay? And the way I'm gonna do this is to use um, <clears throat> just GDB on the command line, or I can just do it here. No, I don't wanna do it here. I wanna do it on a GDB, okay? So I will copy and paste this entire program and put it into the command line. And so we're gonna go to um, let's call this negative exponent <clears throat> dot C. Here's the copy and paste of the entire program. <clears throat> All right. So we are going to E10 to E2. <clears throat> All right, so let's go ahead and figure out what we need to do in this particular subroutine. Um, the first thing we need to do is to go back to the homework assignment and you know, kind of read the instructions very carefully uh, because you know, there are a few questions that people ask me and go like, hmm, uh, are you sure you have read the instructions very, very carefully? All right. So the first thing is we do want to preserve the value being represented as closely as possible, okay? Because it, we, it, ca it cannot be preserved entirely, but we just want to be as close as possible. So the value being represented is the sign, okay? Times, you know, okay, the sign determines whether we're multiplying with a negative one or one, times the coefficient, times two to the power of exp2, times 10 to the power of exp10. That particular value should should not change. You know, no matter what you do with the coefficient, with you know, ex, exp2 or exp10, this particular value should not change, or you try to preserve it as much as as much as possible. <clears throat> and then these are the requirements. The resulting coefficient should make the condition blah 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 true. So the coefficient, you know, this particular requirement is basically saying the coefficient should use up all 64 bits. That's basically what it's saying. The other way to look at this is if you double the coefficient one more time, it is going to exceed what you can represent using a 64-bit unsigned integer. Okay, so that's what this requirement is trying to spell out. The next one says, you know, E10 has to be a zero. The exponent of 10 needs to be a zero, which is kind of the main purpose of this logic. Um, <clears throat> E2 can be any integer, can be positive, can be negative. So you have some flexibility here. Uh, the sign should be preserved. The representative value should be preserved as much as possible. And your entire program should not use anything that rely on float, double, or functions from the math.h you know, header file and comment your code, okay? All right, so given all of these requirements, Let's go to the notes, okay, to find out, you know, what can possibly help you with, you know, doing this homework assignment. And that is section 5.2.1 when the exponent of 10 is less than zero. So I'm not sure how many people actually read the module, okay? But this actually gives you the backbone of the logic of how to do this, okay? So let's go through this a little bit <clears throat> and then we'll go back to um, the actual C program. So as long as the coefficient is less than or equal to the largest possible coefficient value, minus five, then divided by two, do this. In other words, this, is, this part here is spelling out the condition of the loop, taken into consideration that we don't want any side of the comparison to exceed what a 64-bit unsigned integer can represent. Okay, it's just that it is expressed in words and not expressed as a single expression. And when people ask me, so why didn't you write it as a single expression? Well, the answer is easy. I don't want to do your homework. That's, 
because I want you guys to figure this out, okay? I want you to relate the concepts and figure this out. So what are we doing in this loop? We are doubling the coefficient, it is it's doubling, but every time you double the coefficient, in order to preserve the value of v, you have to decrease the exponent of two. Okay, so let's just pause here, okay? This is algebra. Does that make sense to you? When you double the coefficient, which is part of the big gigantic product that we talked about earlier, the whole value is going to double. But you can adjust the exponent of two by decrementing it by one, which basically has the same effect as a division by two. So on one side, you multiply by two, on the other side, you divide it by two, and hence, you know, the value is preserved, okay? So you basically get into this loop and keep doing this until the condition is not true anymore, until C is not less than or equal to the largest possible coefficient value, minus five, then divided by two. Okay, that's, you know, when you get to the, when we get to the code, you will see that it's actually a pretty easy con uh, condition to specify. And then the next step, which is after you get out of this loop, is to do this operation, you add five to the coefficient, which, which by now is a really, really large value. And then you do a division by two, a division by 10, sorry, you divide it by 10, and then you use the floor function around it. So you might say, but the floor function is coming from math.h. Nope, because you can use integer division. Integer division has a built-in floor. When you divide a number by another number and it's an integer division, it is automatically applying the floor operation. That part is automatic. You don't, even, you don't have to specify it. And then the next operation is easy because if you are dividing the coefficient by 10, then V is gonna be divided by 10 too. So how do we make up for that division by 10? You bump up the exponent of 10 by one, which then has the same effect as multiplying the entire thing by 10. So division by 10, multiplication by 10, cancels out, so V is quote unquote preserved, okay? So the one part where V is not preserved has to do with this operation here, because this is rounding, which means you never really always get exactly what the result is supposed to be, but we will try as the best we can, okay? That's basically the approximation part of the entire thing. In other words, section 5.2.1 combined with the explanation of um, the, the rounding operation and also you know, how the power stuff you work from before this should give you enough information to kind of do the homework assignment. So this is one major piece that you should use when you are writing your code is to make use of this information that is available here. There's another piece of information that you can, that you should also make use of, to, that you should utilize, is the log file. The log file would actually tell you if this is the input, then the coefficient, the exponent of 10, and the exponent of two should change in a particular way. So that gives you an idea of, oh, so I need to write loops and conditional statements and whatnot in order to make whatever is in the log file happen. So, okay, let me <clears throat> go back to, this gives you the theoretical foundation. This gives you a way to verify your code. And together, between these two, and also your understanding of programming from CISP 360, I think you should be able to get this done, okay? Or at least get very close to get it done. So let's, let me go ahead and you know, just kind of write the code. <clears throat> So the first thing I need to do is to say while PN points to coefficient <clears throat> is less than zero, do the following. Because this is the same thing as saying as long as, oh, not the coefficient. I used the wrong member. EXP10, there we go. As long as EXP10 is negative, do the following. Okay, <clears throat> what do we need to do? Well, eventually, okay, you know, in each iteration, at some point, we want to increment the exponent of 10 because you know, that's how we can get from a negative exponent of 10 
and then each loop gets me get me closer and closer and eventually hopefully it will get to zero but in order for this to happen I have to um, basically do a division by 10 so the division by 10 is right here coefficient is <clears throat> pn points to coefficient plus 5 the whole thing divided by 10 there's no need to call to call the floor function because <clears throat> coefficient is an unsigned 64 bit unsigned integer it's added to a you know, integer so the sum also automatically has an integer or unsigned 64 bit integer type when that is divided by 10 which is also a integer the whole operation is an integer division and integer division will only give you quote unquote the floor of the result so you don't have to apply floor explicitly it's just that this will get it done automatically okay so this is all good but before we do this we have to maximize okay so we have to say first maximize maximize the coefficient before division by 10 <clears throat> so the maximizing is basically saying as long as <clears throat> the coefficient is less than or equal to I think it's only less than eh, less than or equal to is fine um, the maximum number that you can represent using six, a unsigned 64 bit integer that constant is u in 64 underscore max okay because you know, I told you guys you know, to look it up in the documentation of standard integer dot h and it defines the it defines the macro for you okay so we have to um, so let me go back to the notes here because I cannot remember which way is which way so it says right here the largest possible coefficient value is what I just typed which is u int 64 u int 64 underscore max you have to first minus subtract 5 from it and then divide the whole thing by 2 okay so this divided minus 5 the whole thing divided by 2 so as long as the coefficient is less than this that means I have room for another multiplication by 2 which then will become at the most u in 64 underscore max minus 5 which then gives me the room to add the 5 in the next step after the loop yes uh, possibly I don't think so I'm not missing any type right? Ah, okay. All right. So when you're doubling the coefficient, you know, the what you need to do, okay, so we can say double the coefficient. So that that can be expressed in many ways. <clears throat> um, but one easy way to do it is simply to say let's multiply by two. You can do a left shift operation. You can also have it to add to itself. So all of those would do basically the same thing. But if you are multiplying the coefficient by 2, that means the, the entire product is going to be doubled, which means you have to do something to divide it by 2. And the way to divide it by 2 is to decrement uh, the exponent of 2. Because every time you decrement the ex exponent of 2, at the exponent of 2, the product that we saw earlier is going to be halved. So that's what we need to do to compensate for this, which is exp2 needs to decrement and that's basically most of it okay <clears throat> if this is the code that you turn in you will get a b you know as a letter grade instead of an a because the pro the coefficient after this entire thing is done is not going to use all 64 bits okay this is going to be a little bit short the reason why it's going to be short is really obvious because the coefficient on line 120 before line 28 happens is going to be the largest one okay if you double it again it's going to exceed what a 64-bit unsigned integer, integer can represent and that has to do with the condition of the loop and then what do we do with it we divide it by 10 so after you divide the coefficient by 10 it is no longer the largest number that fits in 64-bit as an unsigned integer 
So after you get out of the loop, okay, the last thing that you do to coefficient before you exit the while loop here is this division. So that means by the time you get out of the loop, you are guaranteed that the coefficient is not going to use up all 64 bits. So you have to do some final adjustment in order to make that happen. So that would be another loop here, but this time it's a little bit easier because we're just looking at the coefficient and as long as it is less than u in 64 underscore max divided by two, let's just double it. PN, okay, I'm too lazy to type, copy, paste, <clears throat> and adjust the indentation, okay? So that's the entire program. All right, any questions about this particular program? Yes. Uh, yep, yep, have been recording since before I worked on this. Yep. When are we supposed to? Okay. <clears throat> what is the difference? So this is a, <clears throat> I'm going to go back to CISP 360 and ask you that question. What is the difference between line 126 and line 134? Okay, so apparently your CISP 360 professor did not actually teach you the differences between a pre-increment or decrement in this case versus a post-decrement. Okay, let's, let's focus on that one first. I'll get back to this one, okay? So we'll take a look at a different program first. So we'll just say increment or decrement, okay? So decrement.c. <clears throat> okay. So in this program, I'm going to have uh, two integers, x, y, okay? And we'll go ahead and initialize both to five, okay? Int y equals five. And then we'll have two additional variables. One is i, uh, one is j, okay? So i and j are just integer variables. I'm going to say i equals to x minus minus, and I'm going to say j equals to minus minus y, okay? So this is a program that can help illustrate the differences, right? So can someone tell me what is going to be the value of i? So let's just say that I'm looking at the value of i on line 10. I put a single breakpoint on line 10 and I want to evaluate the value of i. What would it be? It would be five, very good, excellent. Because as a pre as a post decrement, the value of the expression, okay, the value of this expression is the value of x before the decrement, which is five. Okay? What about the value of j? It will be four because it is a pre decrement, which means the expression is giving you the value of the variable after it is decremented. Does that answer your question? Okay, actually it does not. <laughs> actually it does not answer your question, but let me let's, let's see what, yeah, go ahead. The post decrement, um, we'll actually get to see that by the time we get to the stack operations. So, so there are cases where you want to use a post decrement, or, yeah, or post increment, because you really want the value of the variable prior to the change. But on the same line, you also want to change it, you know, because it, everything is a shorthand, okay? These are all shorthands. In other words, if you, if you have a programming language that cannot do this, that does not have a pre or post decrement operator, then this line simply becomes, becomes 
i equals to x, and then you uh, have x equals x minus 1. It, you can break it up into two distinct um, statements and get the same thing done. The next line can also be done using two you know, ind individual statements, except this time you have to say y gets y minus 1, then j gets y. Say that one more time, please. You mean like this? So if you use another variable, right? Let's let's say k. So k would get four. K would get four. Yep. Mm -hmm. So is that okay? Does that kind of help you guys understand? You know the differences between pre and post decrement or increment, it only makes a difference when you make use of the value of the expression. In other words, this is an expression. x minus minus is an expression. In this case, the value of the expression is used to um, change the value of i. Minus minus y is an expression. In this case, the value of that expression is used to change the value of j. So are we good with this particular example? Okay. Does anyone suspect my statements and really want to see this in GDB? Come on. Come on. Let's do it. Let's do it. <clears throat> GDB is your best friend because you can use it to verify your understanding of your concepts um, to, you know, so much. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. I, wrong folder. I'm not in the folder where the file is. So let me change to the folder first. Um, do it again. Uh, okay. Picky, picky, picky. There was a time, you know, where the C compiler would just let me slip like this one. Like, yeah, I think you know what you're doing. We're fine. Nope. Not anymore. Uh, GDB is not found. Why did I uninstall it? Uh, sure. Okay, there we go. I apologize for that because I was maintaining my system and due to some kind of conflict, it the installed your GDB is back. All right, put a break on line 10, run the program, <clears throat> and then we print what is I, five, what is J, it's a four, okay? Kind of as we expected, okay, very good. All right, so now we can get back to the program that we were looking at, which is negative exponent.c, and we are looking at this function here. So in this context, is anything making use of the, exp the value of the expression of minus minus p n points to exp2? Is it being utilized? No. So it wouldn't matter. I can change line 126 to a post decrement. It's going to be OK. Is that OK? Does that answer your question? I know it's a really long answer to your question, but I think it's necessary because this is a really, really important key concept that should have been introduced in CISP 360. <clears throat> there are a lot of concepts that should be introduced in 360. This is just one of them. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and run this program. Okay. So we'll do a GCC G O. <clears throat> negative exponent x negative exponent dot c uh, gdb negative exponent like that and i want to put a breakpoint on main put a breakpoint on line 180 okay 
run the program, dash n 1.23, t negative 45. We are now at the breakpoint, print n in this case, and that should match what the log file sets at the very end. Does that match? I think so. All right, so does that help you know, with your understanding of you know, the program and you know, what concepts it's trying to tie together? Okay, all right. <clears throat> yes? Um, I can do it in the announcement because not everybody has joined the Discord you know, server but everybody is in Canvas, right? So I can put it in Canvas. I can do it right now. Solution to the negative exponent oops, assignment. C attached. <clears throat> And this is going to be, what is it? Negative exponent dot, ah, no. If I did this, you know, it would have sent just the executable, which is useless to most of you, because you know, most of you cannot <clears throat> run this code on the, in the Windows system. There we go. Publish. All right. So is that okay? Is that good? Okay, excellent. All right, so your new homework assignment is positive you know, exponent, which is doing exactly the opposite. I give you 1.23E45, okay, without the negative, and you have to do the same thing. This time you have to decrement the exponent of 10 all the way down to zero, but the rest of the requirements are the same, okay? So I am going to just kind of leave you with that without any further explanation. It will be, it is due on the Thursday after spring break. So technically you have one week to work on it because I do not expect people to work on their programs during spring break. Yep. Uh, for the exercise, yeah. Five e negative one is it should handle that because you still have a you still have a negative exponent by the time you get to the loop, so it should still handle that one. Let's find out. Okay, I suspect it should. Okay, so uh, run dash n five uh, e negative one. Is that what you're talking about? Okay, so run the whole thing and print n. Worked on that one too. That should become 0.5. Yep. Yep. Because this number turns out to be um, 2 to the power of uh, 63. And so when you multiply 2 to the power of 63 by 2 to the power of negative 64, you get 2 to the power of negative 1, which is 0.5. So it should work. You just gave me a great boundary case to test on all of the programs that people submit. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so any other questions? Was it a difficult homework assignment or was it kind of like, eh, just have to read some documents, you know, read the log file and try to tie everything together and now, this is not the only solution, by the way. I have seen creative solutions where without, it's without a second loop, it has a conditional statement instead inside that has an if-then-else, and it can accomplish the same thing. So this is not the only way to do it, but this is the way that makes the most sense to me. But there are other ways to get this done as well. All right. Are we ready to kind of talk about the positive exponent homework assignment. I'll talk about it a little bit, but I'll leave it up to you guys to find the solution. I'll give you a hint or two. <clears throat> let's see, let's go back here. 
and we are looking at the positive exponent okay it is due on the 21st which is two weeks from today but I would look at it as one week you know as a professor I look at it as one week because I know your know, spring break and, and not everybody's gonna work on their homework assignments <clears throat> the only thing I hope for after spring break is no regression <laughs> that people come back and go like what is a SR latch again or worse yet what is a NAND gate? <laughs> that would not be good. That would not be good. All right, so this is basically the exact opposite. Um, you can use the same file as the negative exponent. In other words, the file that I just shared with you using announcement, you can start with that, okay? It has a solution for the negative exponent assignment already. The two solutions do not conflict with each other. Because one says, as long as e10 or the exponent of 10 is negative, keep doing this. Guess what the other one's going to say? As long as it is greater than zero. So the two loops should never conflict with each other at all. Okay? So that means you can attach your code for this assignment on top of the code that I have written for the assignment that was due today. Or if you don't want to use my code, you can keep using your current code that you turn in for this uh, for the other assignment that was due today. So the requirements is about the same. Coefficient should end up as a value that has bit 63 set. Remember, coefficient is a 64-bit unsigned integer, blah, blah, blah. So basically, it says you, if you double it again, it's going to exceed the largest uh, value that the 64-bit unsigned integer can represent. EXP10 should be a zero. EXP2 can be anything. The represented value V should be preserved, preserved as much as possible. Do not use anything that relates to float or double as built-in types. In other words, basically the same thing. The only difference is um, the number that you'll be given with has a non-zero positive exponent of 10. That's the only difference. All right? So I did say I would, give, I would drop you a hint, two hints. I did say, specify exactly two hints. One is the log file, okay? I, okay, I consider this as one single log file, you know, but there are actually two, so I would suggest you to use both of these as test cases when you are working on your program. So each one has its own log file that will detail you know, how coefficient, exponent of 10, and exponent of two are changed you know, kind of in sequence, okay? So that's one, okay? That's, I consider that just one hint. So where's the other hint? The other hint is in the module, but I cannot remember where the module is. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to go find it myself. Nope. Okay, go away. I don't want to. I don't have to sign in. All right, so let's go back to my notes first. Okay. So go back to the module, and then you look for... The discussion of double, which is also floating point number representation. <clears throat> I had that earlier, you know, somewhere in the in the tab. I just cannot remember where I put it. Anyway, so if the previous assignment is, uh, you can find the logic description in section 5.2.1. Where do you think you will find the instruction for this one? 5.2.2. That's it. Okay. <clears throat> and it looks awfully similar to the other one. This is 5.2.2. It looks awfully similar, except your know, certain things are flipped, okay? Where we used to multiply, it is now dividing, and where we used to be dividing, it is now multiplying. Are you surprised? <laughs> I hope not, okay? Because you know, we are going exactly in the opposite direction in this case. So, um, so that should be enough clue, okay? Combined with the program that I did today, that should be enough clue to help you get the program done. But you do have one week to work on this, excluding spring break. In other words, you know, don't bother me during spring break. No, I'm just kidding you. you if you need to send me something over spring break, you know, I'll still be around to reply to you, except the timeline would not be within a day. It might take me two days, you know, to reply to you. <clears throat> Um, but, you know, I would suggest you to kind of get it started today, okay? Because you know, 
when your mind is fresh, you just saw the solution to the previous homework assignment, and you look at this one and go like, hmm, I think it's related. Yes, they are related. Okay, so it's probably a good idea to get it started today. Um, that's it. Okay, so so we are pretty much done with the discussion of floating point number uh, representation, and now we are getting back to memory devices and other components that you need to use in the processor. <clears throat> All right, so let's go back. And we want to go to John von Neumann. There we go. Are there any questions regarding the analysis of the SR latch from Tuesday? No questions? Okay. So that entire lab has to do with how do you keep track of the state or the states of multiple devices of an SR latch. And in this case, the SR latch only has two NAND gates, okay? It's just that the, the way they're hooked up is kind of funny because the output of one goes back to the input of the other one and vice versa. Okay, so they form, quote, unquote, a loop, but it's not really a loop, okay? Because, you know, it, it can get to steady state in most cases, except the, for the one condition that I showed in class on Tuesday where it goes into oscillations. You know, it doesn't settle on a steady state. So, so that's a good starting point because all the other devices that we'll be talking about is based on the SR latch that we have talked about. Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> uh-huh. Um, that I would not know <laughs> um, because the application of tracking down changes like that is important in industry. If you don't analyze those situations, you can end up with a what we call a raised condition. And a raised condition is problematic because you know, in some cases, the raised condition will favor the correct solution, so the problem does not show up. But as soon as you change uh, the die size, like the size of the transistor, the raised condition can favor the wrong answer, and then suddenly everything does not work anymore. You can, it can also lead to security issues. So I'm, I, I know this is a really long answer to what you just asked, but I do want to give you guys examples. So I want to show this. I cannot remember the name of that particular flaw. It's a security flaw, but it's important. Um, so I'm going to just type down raise conditions, security problem. Oh, it has to do with caching. So all of these are important keywords. Uh, da, 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 da. The one that I had in mind had to do with caching, where you know a malicious program can read the cache of critical parts of an operating system. And I cannot remember the name of the vulnerability. So let me do one more thing here. Vulnerability. There we go. OK, I'm going to cheat here and ask chat GPT. <laughs> what was the vulnerability that has to do with Raise, raise conditions of caching. It does not know the name. Anyway, <clears throat> I will do some more research to find out what the name is for that particular uh, vulnerability. I think it has to do with either virtual memory or caching. Maybe it has to do with virtual memory. I cannot remember exactly you know, what it was about. Um, so what was the vulnerability that had to do with race conditions related to virtual 
memory. Okay. Hmm? Yep, meltdown. That is correct. <clears throat> Apparently, there's also <clears throat> another one called dirty cow. Uh, cow stands for uh, copy on write, which is a fairly common uh, technique for um, caching. But meltdown is the other one. You're correct. So vulnerability meltdown. <clears throat> there we go. Thank you. So Wikipedia has one rather long page to talk about this one. This is not a software issue. It, is a, it was a hardware issue. So I hope that this rather long answer you know, addresses the, the question. So industry, typically people in industry, they don't have to think about this too much. But then stuff like this happens. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure whether you guys are ready for another long story. Yes? OK. <clears throat> you just want me to not talk about what I'm supposed to be talking about today. <clears throat> so many years ago, you know, I used to work for in the private sector. Um, so there was one product that we have been using for years. Um, and then one day, we got a new batch of processors. Um, and the manufacturer said, we didn't change anything. We just reduced the die size. In other words, you know, they made the transistors you know, smaller, so it saves power, you know, and, but everything else you know, should be the same. So we soldered those chips you know, onto the single board computers that we were manufacturing and sent those out without testing because, hey, you know, nothing is supposed to have changed, except none of them worked. Okay? So <clears throat> we didn't change the software. We didn't change the hardware. The manufacturer said the chips you know, should behave exactly the same way. So what is going on, right? So I was tasked, unfortunately, you know, with, you know, okay, tech, get this fixed, okay? And the whole company was breathing on me because, you know, uh, you know the relationship with all the customers who got this you know, new batch of you know, controller boards, you know, is at stake, right? So long story short, I would try to avoid, you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk about all the drama that happened on that day. So long sh story short, it was a software issue, but the software issue did not show up before because of the race condition. The, so the software was not using the registers in the proper way that would lead to a race condition. But the older die, which had larger transistors, had the race condition to favor the correct outcome. So the problem, even though it was a software flaw, it never showed up. The new process with the smaller transistors favor, the timing favors the other outcome of the race condition, and then the problem slightly popped up. We didn't change the software. The software had been flawed to begin with. But because the race condition was masking the software problem, it never showed up. So I think that's also helped answer the question of whether this type of analysis is important. And the answer is yes, it is important. <clears throat> no, uh, I was a software engineer at the time. Um, so that was long before I started teaching you know, over here. So I just identified you know, the wrong instruction, which basically wrote, okay, it was an 8-bit processor, so it can only write 8 bits at a time. But there was an I.O. register, an input-output register, that's by its nature 16-bit wide. So the manual specified that you have to write to the low location and then the high location, because when you write to the low location, it actually um, uses a latch okay, to latch the change. And until it sees the change to the high byte, it won't actually make it effective. But the person who wrote the code you know, did it the other way around. And so it was a software issue. I, I just found the software issue. But at the time, I did not understand the race conditions. I just found that, oh, it was wrong to begin with. But how come the problem did not show up before? That's because of the race condition. <clears throat> All right. So yes, I hope these you know, kind of stories you know, help convince you guys that you know, yep, all of the stuff that I teach here, you know, is going to come in handy at some point. 
depending on where your career takes you. I was a computer science person by training, but I did work on you know um, low level stuff, you know, assembly language programming and other low level stuff, just because of you know that's where my job took me. All right, cool. <clears throat> So now we get back to the memory devices, okay, D flip flops and other basic memory devices. So last time we talked about the SR latch. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit here, okay. We'll get back to this you know, at some point, but I'm going to fast forward a little bit to this thing here, okay. So at some point in time, I decided. It's too much work to describe the circuit in text, so I just drew the diagram so I can actually test it as well. So this is called a clocked and gated D flip-flop, which is you know, a complex device. But you look at this and go like, hmm, but I recognize you know, all the components. <clears throat> this is an SR latch. This is an SR latch. This is an SR latch. This is an AND gate. This is also an AND gate. In other words, this is something that we can construct like today. So the question is, what is that? What does it do? Well, it is called a D flip-flop. A D flip-flop, the D in D flip-flop means data, okay? And the way it works is, in this case, data is what you want the device to remember. If you want, to, if you want it to remember a zero, you put that zero onto data. If you wanted to remember a one, then you put that one onto the data input pin. That's the job of the data input pin. Then what about the other two pins? Well, the other two pins have different purposes. This is the, called the enable pin. The, if the enable pin is a zero, the device would ignore everything. It simply says, I'm not gonna do anything. Regardless of what other values you're putting into the other pins, if enable is a zero, it simply says, I'm not going to do a single thing. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> this is called the clock pin. The clock pin controls the timing of the update. So let's just say that you have enable being a one, okay, and you have presented the data that you want the device to remember onto the data pin. Nothing happens until we see a rising edge on the clock pin. So now I have to explain what is a rising edge. A rising edge means a transition from zero to one. Okay? At that exact moment, when the clock pin goes from zero to one, with the enabled pin being a one, the device will remember the value on the data pin, and that particular value would become Q. In other words, data and Q will quote unquote synchronize at the very moment with EN being a one and the clock pin is transitioning from a zero to a one. Yes? So most of them would use one particular edge, you know, because it can be rising edge or falling edge. Um, the way you change the direction of the edge or to change edge sensitivity, which direction it goes, is simply to introduce a NOT gate if you want to right here. If you put a NOT gate here, then your clock sensitivity will be opposite because a 1 becomes a 0 and a 0 becomes a 1, so it changes you know, which way it's sensitive to. <clears throat> okay. So you guys look at this circuit and go like, well, tech, you can say whatever you want. I'm not really sure the device works the way that you just described it. It sounds really kind of complicated. Well, that's why we have Logisim. This is actually done in Logisim. I don't have the file with me, which is great because I can now do it in class so that you guys can see how to make that particular circuit. <clears throat> so here is Logisim, okay. And what I'm going to do is to do the trick that I did last time, okay, which is you know, kind of copy and paste this image here, make it um, always on top. So this way I can always keep a visibility on this particular window. And then switch back to Logisim in order to create the actual circuit. Uh, okay, I'll stash it over here for now. And then I'll put Logisim all the way over here. 
and we'll create the circuit, okay? So we have three input pins. Now when you draw a circuit, it's best to use the input pin on the toolbar because that already has the, um, the three state control you know, being turned off, you know, which is usually what how I, you would prefer that. So just a little tips here. This is clock, this is enable, EN, and this is our data pin. <clears throat> All right, so we have two AND gates. So with AND gates, we go to the gates category, go to AND, pick up one, you know, change it a little bit, okay. <clears throat> and then duplicate this one, because you know, the second one, I wanted to have three input pins. So I'm gonna change the number of input pins to three. And then we'll, we'll make the design a little bit more compact, you know, because I don't have as much space as the other one. There we go. And we'll label these two. This is uh, A1 as N gate one. This is A2 as N gate two. Now we don't have any SR latch. Now we do have SR latches in Logisim, but that's not the one that I want to use. So what I'm gonna do is I will create my own SR latch circuit, okay? So we'll just call this SR for SR latch. <clears throat> and I hope you guys still remember how to make an SR latch from last time. We pull out two NAND gates, change the input to two, make it narrow, like so. Duplicate. And this time I'm not going to bother to name the individual components. You know, simply because one, I don't have the time, and two, it is not necessary because you know it's symmetric. You know, if you look at the circuit with a mirror kind of in between here, this, the circuit is symmetric. So we have output pins like so. This goes here. This goes here. This goes all the way back. Here, and then this one has to be drawn like that. This goes here, this goes here. There we go. Okay, so this is an SR latch. Um, I can go to the appearance and just kind of give it a few labels, okay? SR, and then we got Q, and in Q, oops, and Q. There we go. <clears throat> so labels are useful because you know this way, you know, when I'm building a larger component using this smaller component, at least I can tell you know which pin is which pin. You know, makes it a little bit easier to read with the other circuit. So that's all I need for the SR latch. So now SR latch becomes a component that I can use here. So I put this one here. I need another one down here. I'm just lining up the pin so I don't have to draw lines all over the place. And then this one kind of goes here with a Q pin on the right hand side here. There we go. Okay, so I'm just you know, replicating the circuit here. Um, and I can line this up a little bit better. Goes here. This one goes to both. Okay. So it goes to here. And it goes to the middle one here. It doesn't really matter which one it goes to, you know, because it kind of works the same way. And then the clock pin. Wait. Okay, I just miss I just drew it incorrectly. The enable pin goes to both. The clock pin also goes to both. So that means if this one goes, yeah, I can put it here. Uh huh. They are not exactly the same thing. So we'll we'll, we'll take a look. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third pin of A two is coming from N Q. <clears throat> so this is it looks a little ugly, but this will have to do. And then the A1's output 
goes to R. And then data goes to R of this SR latch. A2 output go to the S pin over here. And then the not Q over here goes to the S pin on top. All right, let's do a gigantic loopy loop. There we go. And then the other pin Q goes to the R here. And then the this pin also go to the S pin over here. And then this goes to the output. Okay. Okay, let me just double check, make sure everything looks good. I see what you mean when you said your know, uh, clock and enable seem to be symmetric because they can they both connect to both two pins of A1 and A2. All right, so what we'll do is we are now going to test the circuit. Um, the enable pin is a zero right now, and the output is unknown because you know, when I set up the circuit, the first time I power up you know, the SR latch, the SR latch all the way to the right hand side, is both inputs being ones, which means Preserve your current state. What is my current state? Unknown. I never told you what your current state is supposed to be. That's why we get the red wire you know, that reports as an error. It's not exactly an error. It simply means I don't know what that state is supposed to be right now. So what we want to do is to say, hmm, let's change, let's try to change your Q to a one. Okay. So now you go like, okay, I want this circuit to remember a one, nothing happens, right? Okay. If you are forgetting the enable pin and you just go like, okay, maybe I just need a rising edge, a rising edge at the clock pin, eh, nothing happens. So the key is you have to do both. You have to first enable and then you give it a rising edge. Then the state of the data pin is now mirrored to the output of the entire circuit. Is that okay? So let's try again. Let's try to reset it to a zero, okay? So you can say, oh, okay, now that it's enabled, let's just change the data to a zero. Oh, nothing happens because there's no rising edge at the clock pin yet, okay? So now I have to go to the clock pin and say, well, maybe this circuit is going to be sensitive to a falling edge. Nope, okay? But now if I click the clock pin again, which gives it a rising edge again, then it works, okay? So I have come up with all kinds of analogies for this particular scheme. <clears throat> Some are not very politically correct, so I will refrain from those particular analogies. And I would use one that is not politically incorrect, but it is increasingly not connecting with you know, my students because you guys are not growing up with the devices that I grew up with, cameras, okay? I hope most of you still remember what a camera is. You might have seen your grandpa, you know, using one, right? Okay. <clears throat> so let's think about the typical digital, you know, electronic camera. Um, you know, a kid will pick it up and start, you know, clicking, right? Nothing happens. What is going on? Why, why is nothing happening if, you know, if the kid is just pull, picking up the camera and keep clicking the shutter release? because it's not on, exactly. So the on-off of the camera is kind of like the enable pin, okay? The enable pin is the on-off switch of a camera, okay? So let's say a kid picks up the camera, turn, you know, click it on, and then just kind of point it to people that you know, wants, he, he or she wants to take pictures of, and it, at the end of the day, nothing happened. Why? Because you have to click the shutter release button, okay? The motion of clicking that button, you know, the downward motion, is what is triggering the camera to go like, oh, you want me to take a picture now, right? So the shutter release button is the clock pin. It's looking for a transition on the 
shutter release bu you know, button in order to take a picture, you, to snap the picture. But before the picture can be snapped, it has to be turned on first. So that's what the enable pin is trying to do. The data pin is really just whatever the lens is capturing with the camera. It can be changing all day long. But nothing is going to be recorded over here unless the camera is on and somebody clicks this shutter release. Yes? It's called a clock pin because in the in the typical use in a system, the clock pin you know, is tied in in some fashion to the main clock of the CPU of the processor. Now we are not quite there yet. Okay, so by the time we get there, then we'll talk about you know, why it's called a clock pin because it will be more obvious at that point. All right, so why do we need both? Why not just use one and say? Enabled, go ahead and look at you know, what the data pin has and remember that. Or just the other one, okay, you know, just use the clock pin, you know, don't have an enable pin. Whenever you click this, you know, you know, clock pin, it will remember because they serve two different purposes. Think about an orchestra, okay, think about a band, an orchestra or whatever, you know, um, uh, music ensemble that you're used to, okay. So typically you have a conductor, right? The conductor is gonna kind of use a baton and you know, kind of wave stuff, right? And then the conductor would also use gestures, right? Occasionally, he, you know, he, the, the conductor will use a gesture and go like, what does that mean? Yeah, okay, you, you guys need to, need to be louder. That usually is typically diverted to, uh, to the flute section because flutes are very, very quiet instruments despite you know, the best effort of whoever is blowing into the flute, they just don't make a whole lot of sound. And occasionally the conductor would go, what is that? You guys need to soften a little bit. That's usually directed to the trumpet section because those guys, you know, it's hard to play a trumpet not loudly, okay? or saxophone for that matter. Okay, but at the same time, the conductor would be waving the baton like this, or this, right, or this, okay? What is that doing? It's the clock, it is the timing, okay? So sometimes an entire section, you know, an entire you know, uh, collection of instruments need to be off, okay? That's the enable. But the, the time is still going, right? You know, the conductor is still keeping track of the time. That's why there are two different pins. One controls who is supposed to be paying attention and changing. The other one is controlling when it is supposed to be changing, okay? So that's why we have two different pins. Is that okay? Is that analogy working? All right. <clears throat> so now that we have talked about this circuit, it is not the end product, but it is pretty close to the end product. So after this, which is a clocked and gated, your know, gate means you know, the enable, we have a little bit more, okay? This is another circuit, which is very similar to the one before, except that we got this little thing here, okay? The, the OR gate and the AND gate over here, along with the reset pin, is new. This is necessary because when you first power up a computer, what do you think are the states of the individual D flip-flops in the, in the system? They're all over the place. Some are ones, some are zeros. We have no idea who is what, okay? So what this circuit brings to the table is the ability to reset a circuit. So when the reset pin, if I remember this one correctly, this is active low, which means when the reset pin is a zero, then the circuit will bypass everything else and just tell the final you know, SR, SR latch and say, just make it a zero. Okay, so it is a mechanism that is needed when you're first powering up your computer or when you hit the reset switch off the computer. Everything resets to a certain known state, which is typically zero. It doesn't have to be zero, but in this case, it is zero. So let's see what, how that works, okay? When the reset pin is a zero, okay, where does it go? It goes to the end gate over here. 
And if one input of the AND gate is a zero, do we know the guaranteed output of the AND gate? It has to be a? No. It has to be a zero, right? Because this is a regular AND. It is not a NAND gate in this case. So that means R is guaranteed to be a zero when the reset pin is a zero. What about the R, uh, what about the S pin? The S pin is getting the output of the OR gate, but this OR gate is first negating the reset pin first. So if the reset pin is a zero, then the OR gate would see a one on that particular pin. Can you guarantee the output of an OR gate if at least one input is a one? It has to be a, has to be a one, very good. So now we have a one presented to the S, we have a zero presented to the R. According to the truth table that we worked out on Tuesday, that guarantees the output of SRC or the SR slash C so that the Q pin is guaranteed to be a zero. Um, the not Q is not really going anywhere, so we don't really care, but it would be a one. So that's why you know, this reset pin can ignore, okay? It doesn't care whether you know, the device is enabled. It does not care whether there's a rising edge or not. At the moment you put the reset pin to a zero, it just changes the final SR latch to a zero. Now it has a known state. Yes? Um, that's a very good question. Um, just symbolically speaking, this is the way we like to do it. But the other way to do this is you can just put a NOT gate symbol over here before it feeds into the OR gate. You know, most people do not like to draw NOT gates you know, because you know, otherwise you end up with a lot of NOT gates. So putting a bubble at the input pin of a particular device is the same as having, having that input negated. Um, the bubble is also used for output negation, and that's why the NAND gate has a little bubble at the output compared to a regular AND gate. So all of these symbols have you know, certain meanings, and they're usually very consistent. All right, so this is a resettable, you know, D flip-flop, you know, where at, at the power up of a system, the reset pin can be held low or zero, for a certain period of time to make sure all the devices start with a known state, which is zero in this case. So are we still doing okay so far with all of these explanations? Yes, go ahead. Yes, yeah, sort of, okay. So with current motherboards, you know, with modern motherboards, it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, because you know, if, especially if you have a laptop computer, there's no such thing as a hard reset button on a laptop computer. Um, when your computer first powers up, okay, power is not stable yet, okay? In other words, let's just say that all your chips wants to have five volts or 3.3 .3 volts or 1.8 volts you know, in order to operate. That voltage does not just go from zero to five volts you know, in no time, okay? There's a ramp up time. When the voltage is ramping up, there's no telling what the devices are going to do. So what happens is there's a special chip on your, in most of your computer systems called a watchdog chip. The watchdog chip you know, is the one that would monitor the, um, the voltage of the entire system, and it would put, if it's not healthy, okay, you know, let's say your system needs 3.3 you know, volts in order to operate you know, nominally. So until the voltage gets to 3.3 volts, the watchdog chip, you know, because of the electronics in the watchdog chip, will hold the reset line zero. So your entire system is, quote unquote, you know, held in a reset state until the voltage gets to a healthy state, then it releases the, the reset, and then your know, things will start to operate. It is also the same kind of watchdog mechanism that gives you the blue screen of death. Okay, so what is the blue, the blue screen of death and how does it happen? Not exactly, okay, so in this case, the watchdog chip, the watchdog chip is called the watchdog chip because it is a watchdog. 
which means periodically it has to be, okay, I hate to use this word, but that's you know, technically what people call, you have to hit the watchdog, like periodically. <laughs> and so the, the period depends on the watchdog, okay? You know, some watchdogs you know, need to be hit like every half a second, and others maybe every you know, three seconds or so. So you can find a variation of this, okay? But the idea is you have to hit the watchdog, okay? You have to basically give it a ping, okay? Every half second, every second, every three seconds, okay? But it has to be a certain interval. What, what if you don't give it that, you know, in, what, if, what if you don't give it that little ping every half second or so? It times out and resets the system. That is when you get the blue screen of death. So under normal operation, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, your know, most operating system will be sending little pulses to the watchdog every half a second or so to basically say, yep, I'm still alive, don't reset me, okay? When something really, really bad happens, that mechanism stops working. In other words, your operating system is getting into a non-interruptible state that it just hung up, okay? It, it's really, really bad, okay? You can have a, have a crash and not get into the blue screen of death, but occasionally get into that con condition where you know, the mechanism of hitting the watchdog, which is a software mechanism, stops working. That is when you get the blue screen of death because the watchdog would issue a NMI, which stands for non-maskable interrupt, which basically means there's no way for the processor to ignore that particular interrupt. When that happens, it will go into a special routine depending on the operating system. In the case of Windows, that particular routine will give you, quote unquote, the blue screen of death, okay? Basically, it gives you the option of showing you a few code on the screen and also doing a memory dump onto the hard drive so that this way you can do forensics afterwards to find out, okay, what caused this whole thing to happen? You can examine the entire memory content of the system, your know, post-mortem, basically, in that case. So I know this is way beyond you know, the scope of this class, but at some point, someone in this class is going to run into these you know, design decisions and hopefully it will be useful to someone. <clears throat> this is also how uh, your phone sometimes, it can decide that it is in a bad state and it will restart itself. It's because you know, the software is so corrupted or so crashed that it cannot hit the watchdog anymore. And then the watchdog times out and then your phone just decides, I'm gonna restart myself. So it's, it's a safety mechanism for the most part. All right, okay, so now we are moving on to the last portion here. So if you look at this thing as one single device and you just go like, what happens when we make a whole, kind of link a whole bunch of these things together in this particular way? So let's take a closer look at this picture here. Um, so in this picture, we have one single clock that is multi-dropped to all of these individual D flip-flops. Do you see that? We have one single enable, which is also multi-dropped into all of these you know, individual devices. And we have one reset, also doing the same thing. It's multi-dropped into all of these resets. So all of these D flip-flops, and there are eight of them, they share exactly the same clock, they share exactly the same enable, and they share the same exact reset. What do they not share? the data pin, and also the Q pin. So when you look at the data pin of these individual ones, they are coming out of the splitter. This is the input pin, is an eight bit in data pin. Each bit of the data pin goes to a individual D flip flop, and then each output of the D flip flop goes to a particular line of another splitter, and they all get merged to Q. In other words, this is the multi-bit version of a D flip-flop. Instead of being able to remember one single bit at the clock rising edge while enabled, it can remember eight bit at a time. Is that okay? That's it. 
but it has a special name. It is no longer called a D flip flop. Now it is called a register. So a register is basically a multi bit D flip flop. Essentially, that's what it is. And we use registers to remember things inside the processor. Now, by the way, this is not RAM, okay? RAM or ra uh, random access memory is not like this, okay? This is basically a component inside the processor itself. It is not in RAM. All right, so at this point, we are really getting close to talk about the entire processor, and tonight's lab, there is a lab tonight. So tonight's lab is to look, examine uh, two specific devices. So let me give you the access code, and then we'll talk about it just a little bit. <clears throat> and this is basically part one of two, you know, that talk about the individual devices in the system. So the way you do this is you have to read the documentation a little bit. So this is the lab for tonight. It's called Components of the Processor. And I will make it visible to you right now. The access code is edgy. Oh, let's take row first, okay? I want, I want to take row because I made a very special access code for today. I'm not gonna waste my effort of making that particular access code. So today is uh, March 7th. I think we got enough time. You guys are fast typers. I know you can do it. The access code is spring row. If you're not getting the joke, that's okay. It's a very unique talent of mine to come up with jokes that no one else can understand. But is that a still a joke? Yes, I'm laughing at it, just quietly. Yes. Hmm? Tidy. Yes. Hmm? Yes. <laughs> so it's crunchy rope. Do you, do you need more time? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll give I'll give you guys some more, a little bit more time. But after this, I still need to go back to Logisim to show you what you need to do. Okay, so I will extend the time a little bit to 7 p.m. I think that should be sufficient time. All right, so don't leave just yet because I still need to go back to Logisim to show you a few things. All right, so going back to Logisim. So for tonight's lab, you need to read some documentation on your own. Uh, you can go to help. Go to library reference. Okay, let me bring that window up here. All right. So once you get there, uh, you have to read what is a multiplexer. So this is one of the devices that you will be trying to understand how to how it works. So this is the understand. This is the explanation of a multiplexer. The other one that you also need to understand is um, a register. So for that one, you have to go to memory library and then click on, click on register. But register, we have talked about for the most part already. So you should have a pretty good understanding of registers without having to read the documentation in Logisim. But for a multiplexer, you kind of have to read it a little bit, okay? Um, I can give you a long, a really quick summary of what a multiplexer is. A multiplexer is a switch. Think about railroad, okay? So you can see you know, the entire country has you know, multiple railroad and you know, trains can go everywhere. So what happens when two tracks need to merge into one? There's a switch in between, okay? So a multiplexer is essentially a switch. That's all it is. It has multiple inputs and one single output. And then it has a control mechanism to specify, oh, so which input should I connect to that one single output? That's basically the essence of a multiplexer. Yes? It has to be, it has to be the same. So if your input has like four, if each port of the input has four bits, 
then the output also needs to have four bits. Um, it's basically whatever this port is seeing becomes the output of the multiplexer. But you have multiple input ports that you can connect to the output. Yes, exactly. Yep. So it, it is essentially a railroad switch. So you need to have other input pins to specify how should I choose the input. Yep. So with that, you know, it, the documentation should be a whole lot easier to understand. All right. So I'll see you guys over there. And I'm going to upload the lecture right now.